responsible for these flagrant violations of our national security. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor. The Senator from New Jersey. Madam uh, President, I rise uh, to uh, challenge the obstinacy of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to prevent us from doing anything that can help ordinary families in our country to get back on their feet and succeed. As a matter of fact, uh, it was very clearly uh, stated by the, major, by the minority leader, the Republican leader, to tell us that his number one priority, imagine that, uh, the leader of the Republican Party in the United States Senate, his number one priority is to make sure that President Obama is a one-term president. And I ask, what is that, what good is that? to the people who don't have jobs, or the people whose mortgages are about to be foreclosed, or their kids can't get an education, no matter how smart they are, because it's impossible to afford it, imagine. And stated proudly on the floor of this Senate that the mission is to destroy the presidency. Shame on you. His, leader, his number one priority, not to create jobs, preventing another financial crisis, or keeping our children safe and, he and healthy. It's just that cynical goal of destroying the presidency, no matter how much harm, no matter how much pain these actions inflict on our general population. It's a disgrace. And what we've seen, and we've seen what the Republicans are willing to do to accomplish this goal, they brought our nation to the brink of default. They shut down the Federal Aviation Administration. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming to extend the payroll tax cut, just to name a few of the most egregious examples. Now, the Republican mission appears to be punishing the American people with longer waits in the courtrooms for judgments to be concluded. There are currently 74 federal judicial vacancies waiting to be filled. In other words, nearly one in 11 federal judgeships across this country are vacant. <coughs> are vacant. <coughs> These vacancies are not some abstract problem that only lawyers and academics care about. Judicial vacancies deny everyday Americans and businesses the justice and redress our Constitution guarantees. <clears throat> and millions of them have had their cases delayed. At a time when our economy is making a fragile recovery, we cannot afford to have a legal system that makes it more difficult for businesses to get Judgment, legal judgment, certainty about their rights and responsibilities uh, to move their operations, for instance, to full gear, perhaps. But now we've learned that the Senate Republicans are committed to making matters even worse. Roll call reports <clears throat> that at yesterday's weekly luncheon of the Conservative Steering Committee, Minority Leader McConnell decided to halt Stop all circuit court confirmation. How can our democracy function when we can't even put judges in the courtroom? The very next nominee in line to be formed the circuit court is a highly qualified nominee from New Jersey, and we need her on the bench now. Magistrate Judge Patty Schwartz has been nominated to serve on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Her nomination was favorably reported by the Judiciary Committee on March 8th, March 8th, nearly 100 days ago. They refused to let us take it up. More than, for more than three months, 
She's waited patiently for a confirmation vote. She's anxious to get to work here, and we need her, while the Republicans in the Senate play games with the confirmation process. And now, <clears throat> Judge Schwartz is on the verge of receiving a vote and filling a critical vacancy. Republicans have pulled the rug out to make sure that she doesn't sit there. It's not fair to the judge, to Judge Schwartz, or to the people of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware who deserve to have a fully staffed federal bench. And it sends a particularly noxious message to the women of this country. Of the, this country. If confirmed, Patty Schwartz would fill a void who would be the only, the second woman, woman ever to represent New Jersey on that appeals court. This obstruction is especially outrageous given this person's record of skill and competence and admiration that Judge Schwartz has earned in the legal community. Her nomination has received strong bipartisan support in our state. Her supporters include Republican Governor Chris Christie, uh, and a for he's a former United States Attorney uh, in New Jersey, and he says Judge Patty Schwartz has committed her entire professional life to public service, and now is the and New Jersey is better for it. His statement. And if Governor Christie and I agree on someone, you know she's really got to be good. And we're not the only ones who feel so strongly about Patty Schwartz's stellar qualifications for the bench. John Lacey, who is the past president of the Association of New the New Jersey Federal Bar, said that Judge Schwartz, and I quote, is thoughtful, intelligent, has an extraordinarily high level of common sense, Thomas Curtin, chairman of the Lawyers Advisory Committee for the U.S. District Court of New Jersey, said, and I quote him, every lawyer in the world will tell you she's extraordinarily qualified, a decent person, and an excellent judge. The American Bar Association clearly agrees. They gave her the highest, their highest rating of unanimously well-qualified. <clears throat> A review of Judge Schwartz's experience shows why she has earned such respect and praise. Since 2003, Patty Schwartz has served as a U.S. US magistrate judge in the District of New Jersey, where she's handled more than 4,000 civil and criminal cases. She graduated from Rutgers University with the highest honors from the University of Pennsylvania Law, Law School, where she was an editor of the Law Review and was named her class's Outstanding Woman Law Graduate. As Governor Christie said, Patty Schwartz has devoted her entire career to public service, and preventing her from do so will only hurt American people, people in our, uh, in our uh, uh, area, uh, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, only hurt those people seeking justice and our very system of democracy. Madam President, it's often been said, justice delayed is justice denied. It's a lesson that people in New Jersey and all the country are learning, and it's got to stop. All Americans should be aware of the price that they pay for the obstruction of the Republicans on uh, the, their side of the aisle. When these confirmations are blocked, it's not just nominees that suffer. The justice system suffers under the weight of vacancies, and the American people suffer longer waits for justice in overburdened courts. <clears throat> it's time for Republican politicians to stop blocking votes on these well-qualified nominees and allow the United States Senate to confirm them without further delay. And, and, and make no mistake. I take very seriously the Senate's constitutional duty of advice and consent regarding presidential nominees. I do not believe that the Senate should rubber stamp judicial nominees without consideration or deliberation. However, what we see today is an unprecedented level of obstruction in confirming judges. 
At this point in the uh, term of President George W. Bush's uh, presidency, the Senate had confirmed 179 judges, 28 more than the 151 of President's nominees who have been confirmed to date. And President Obama's nominees have been forced to wait approximately four times as long as President Bush's nominees to be confirmed after being favorably reported by the Judiciary <laughs> Committee. We didn't, when we had the, the numbers uh, favoring our majority, we didn't permit delays like this. <clears throat> we never would use that as a punishment <clears throat> for, the pres for a presidency that we disagree with. As a result, the vacancy rate is nearly twice what it was at this point in, George, in President Bush's first term. These delays and destroyed tactics cannot be what our founding fathers had in mind <clears throat> when they gave us the power of advice and consent. I'm the son of immigrants who came to this country, and I got the message often from my parents and my grandparents. Uh, to come to America, uh, find a better way of life than you had in Russia or Poland where their birthplace. And I view our justice system as a new nation's premier institution. It demonstrates so well what America is about. Now, I <clears throat> am proud that a courthouse in Newark, New Jersey, bears my name. It has an inscription that I authored. And, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the inscription ought to look like. And uh, I came up with this. The true measure of a democracy is its dispensation of justice. When people walk in that courtroom, they have to know that they have an equal chance at a proper decision <coughs> uh, that, uh, like anybody else. And there shouldn't be the discrimination that exists when we don't fill vacancies that are begging to be filled with qualified candidates. All in this chamber know when the just dispensation of justice is obstructed and delayed, our democracy suffers. And so, Madam President, I plead with our Republican colleagues Stop the obstruction. Allow the Senate to vote on Judge P Patty Schwartz's confirmation without further delay. And put off your attempt to uh, uh, discredit the President Obama's uh, uh, tenure as president. Uh, it, that doesn't fit in here. You want to do it in the political mainstream. You want that, those wild gestures and those, those ridiculous claims that they want to destroy President Obama's uh, uh, tenure. No, don't do that. Don't do that to the American people. Be fair. Do your job. Let's get on with it. With that, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Rhode Island. Madam President, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, the interest rate on subsidized student loans is set to double in just over two weeks. And this will hit middle class families hard at a time when they are reeling from the devastating effects of the most severe recession that we have witnessed in our lifetimes. Earlier this week, the Federal Reserve reported uh, additional sobering news. Between 2007 and 2010, median family wealth declined by nearly 40%. Median family income declined by nearly 8%. And the share of families with education-related debt rose from 15.2% to 19.2%. Certainly, this is no time to increase the interest rate on need-based student loans on the more than 7 million low- and moderate-income students who rely on them to go to college. What we've seen is a middle class that has been in terms of wealth and income shrinking dramatically. Now, ironically, perhaps not ironically, but the very, very wealthy have actually seen income and wealth increase. 
But for the vast majority of Americans, they have seen their economic position deteriorate. And closely allied with economic opportunity and the idea of making your way in this country is the need, the necessity to go on to higher education. We've been preaching that. That's what our parents told us. Go on to college. We couldn't go. And when you go on to college, you'll be prepared to go into the workforce, increase your, your family income, contribute more to your country. And yet, now we see a situation where not only is there a compression in middle income wealth and income, there's also a staggering amount of student debt, almost a trillion dollars. In fact, I've heard reports suggesting that it's eclipsed credit card debt in terms of what households in America are holding. And so you have a generation of college students who have graduated and struggling with this debt. The worst thing we can do now is double the interest rate on those who need more loans to finish their school and put even a greater burden on them and their families as they go forward. We need to pass this legislation that prevent the doubling. We need to do it before July 1st. We're looking at also a period of time where interest rates are very, very low. You know, the Federal Reserve is charging financial institutions somewhere around 1% or less to borrow money, and yet we're going to students and say, it used to be 3.4, now it'll be 6.8. That seems not only incongruous, but incomprehensible, that we would allow this rate to double, particularly in this environment. Now, students' families can't absorb this increase. They're stretched too thin already. Every statistic, but forget the statistics. Just talk to people back home in New Hampshire or Rhode Island or New Jersey. And they'll tell you, it's tough. You know, children are moving back in with families because they're struggling to find a good job, pay student debt, just get by. This is not the time to, to double the interest rate on these loans. It's an issue of fairness. It's an issue of the future of this country. It's an issue of avoiding, really, you know, innumerable personal tragedies. We were just on the phone in a conference call and a... A woman called in and said that she, you know, she's involved with many students who have graduated in the last few years, and they're at, literally at their wit's end. They, they can't pay their debts. They, they don't have jobs that, are, they, that will give them the chance to, to move on, saddle with all their debt. How do they even begin to think to start, of starting a family and buying a home? Something that my generation sort of took for granted about the mid-20s, we have to deal with this issue. This is the first step. Now, according to the Georgetown University Center on Education Workforce, over 60% of jobs will require some post-secondary education by 2018. We know that no longer is higher education some nice thing to do. It's become a necessity to get jobs uh, uh, that will provide for a family. And yet, in 2010, only 38.3% of working in Agile to have a two-year or four-year degree. So we, we know there's a gap already. We've got about 40% of people that have post-secondary education, and experts are telling us we'll need 60 by 2018. That's just four years away. And we're proposing to make it harder to pay for college? Again, it does not make any sense. That's why last January, uh, working with my colleague, Joe Courtney, from the Connecticut in the House of Representatives, we introduced the Student Loan Affordability Act. We saw this coming. We knew we had to prevent this increase. And initially, the response from our colleagues on this side was, uh, no way. In fact, they voted for two budgets that assumed the interest rate would double, therefore giving more resources for tax cuts and other preferences that certainly won't be as effective to help the middle class as giving a youngster a chance to go to college. But we continue to push, and with the president and students and families across the country and student organizations across the country, I think we've made some progress. We've seen at least a change in rhetoric. Governor Romney declared that he was for keeping the rates low, no specification of how we do this, no urging to do this, but at least conceptually there seems to be agreement on that one point. And then the Republican leaders followed suit. Yes, we, we've got to keep this from doubling, this interest rate from doubling. But we haven't seen the, the actions that match these words. 
They initially made a proposal uh, to keep the interest rates low by going after preventive health care. And that's really a non-starter. We understand, I hope we all understand that, one, if we're going to improve the quality of health care in this country, we have to emphasize preventive care. Oh, and by the way, if we're going to bend that proverbial cost curve, we better start doing more prevention than treatment because it's a lot more cost effective than to prevent than treat disease. Then they proposed another offset that would take resources in low and middle income families and various programs, sort of saying, you know, from one pocket of a middle income family and a low income family that needed help, take that and then give it to them in the education pocket. That didn't work. And they continue to resist the proposal we made initially to pay for it because we do understand in this environment that you have to be fiscally responsible. We pose to close, uh, propose rather to close one of the most egregious loopholes in the tax code. There is a provision that allows three or four high-paid lobbyists, high-paid lawyers, high-paid consultants to avoid their payroll taxes, their Medicare taxes, their other taxes, by forming a Chapter S corporation, and then at the end of the year, give themselves a dividend, which is not. Uh, wages subject to these taxes, and it's actually treated at a very preferential tax rate. In fact, this was such an outrageous loophole that was condemned by Bob Novak, the late conservative columnist. It was condemned by the Wall Street Journal. It was condemned by everyone, but it was not something that they could accept. Well, we've moved forward. Uh, we've put a new offer on the table, led by leader Harry Reid, and that would effectively help with respect to pension liabilities. First, it would uh, give employers more predictability in terms of their contributions by allowing them to smooth out the interest rate which they assume in their contributions to the fund. Uh, if you're trying to fund a liability, a pension liability, over many years, you have to put in principal, but then you have to assume an interest rate to see if that principal will grow to an adequate amount. The so present law looks back about two years, and this is a remarkably low interest rate environment. And so with low interest rates, they have to put more principal in. This way, they could look but further back, smooth out, take a more realistic interest rate that will reflect not just the last two years, which one would argue is very exceptional in terms of interest rates, but look at something that's more representative of the 20 or so years that they must provide for in their pension fund. And in fact, this is a provision that employers think is very important to them. The other side is to provide an increase of funding to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the, the insurance fund, because too often today, they have to step in where companies go bankrupt and their pension funds are not adequate to pay for it, even part of the liabilities, the bona fide liabilities that they owe to workers, many of whom who spent years in their employ and are depending upon that pension. So this is a, a very balanced approach. In fact, it's an approach that in the past has had bipartisan support. So I hope that we're reaching the point now where we can come together. Now, this is a incredibly difficult issue for families across this country. I've heard pleas from Rhode Island families uh, to fix this, pl please. Uh, I received uh, letters and calls. You know, one of them uh, came in and it was, please continue to fight for keeping the interest rate of staff at loans down to 3.4 percent. It is difficult enough to pay for college. With unemployment so high for recent college graduates, our financial future seems bleak. My parents and I have taken loans to pay for my, my and my sister's tuition. We are from a middle class family. We appreciate your support and help with this issue. Those words are more eloquent than mine. So let's just get this done. We've got no time to waste. July 1st is almost upon us. We've two weeks. Let's come together. Let's help people across this country and help our country. Thank you, Madam President, and I would yield the floor. I would also note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cook.
Madam President. Senator from Wyoming. Uh, Madam President, I ask that the uh, unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Yes, unanimous uh, consent to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, the, uh, the President of the United States uh, earlier today was in Cleveland. Uh, he spoke for 54 minutes, and yet he said almost nothing, at least certainly nothing that most of us have not heard before. It was two years ago this very weekend, two years ago this weekend, that the White House announced the start of what it referred to as the Recovery Summer. That campaign effort was an effort to convince the American people that the Obama administration's policies to create jobs, that the policies were working. David Axelrad, who was the senior advisor to the president, said at the time, he said, quote, this summer, we're talking about the summer of 2010, he said, this summer will be the most active Recovery Act season yet. Again, that was the summer of 2010. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, and it was entitled, quote, Welcome to the Recovery. Again, that was 2010. Now here we are, two years later. And Americans are still waiting for a real recovery. The recovery summer failed to produce results because it was never more than just a cheap slogan. It was designed to hide the fact that an unaccountable administration had no real solutions. Instead of working to create a healthier economy, President Obama has offered more excuses, more gimmicks, and more empty promises that he continues to say the economy is about to turn the corner. This past March, President Obama said things would get better soon. Day by day, he promised, we're restoring the economy from crisis. We've heard this all before. In February of 2009, the President said that his stimulus bill was, quote, the beginning of the first steps to set our economy on a firmer foundation paving the way to long-term growth and, and prosperity. That's the end of his quote. In April 2010, he said, quote, our economy is stronger. That economic heartbeat, he said, is growing stronger. In 2011, January of that year, he claimed, quote, the next two years, he said, or our job now is putting our economy into overdrive. Now, after disappointing jobs numbers for May of this year, when just 69,000 jobs were created, the President once again promises we will come back stronger. You know, it's a shame that our economy doesn't run on the President's rhetoric. Saying that things will get better does not make them better. Well, the President's record speaks for itself. For starters, we all remember early 2009 when the incoming Obama administration told the American people that its stimulus plan would keep unemployment below 8%. That's what they said. Would keep unemployment, they said, below 8%. Instead, we have now had 40 straight months, 40 consecutive months, with unemployment over 8%. By now, unemployment was supposed to be even much better because the administration had said that by mid-2012, where we are right now, today, their projections were that unemployment would be below 6% if the stimulus bill passed. Well, the stimulus bill passed. I voted against it. But instead, unemployment has ticked up again in May to 8.2%. Last month, one official at the Federal Reserve said it might take four to five more years, four to five additional years, to get unemployment down to 6% which was where the President promised it would be at today. The latest jobs report also said that over 23 million Americans are unemployed or are working at less of a job than what they would like. President Obama said the other day, he said, quote, the private sector is doing fine. 
He said it in a nationally televised press conference. He said the private sector is doing fine. He went on to say it was only government jobs that were lagging behind. Well, I think that to many of these over 23 million Americans who are, are unemployed or uh, underemployed, that they would absolutely disagree with this president. Under the Obama economy, since early 2009, we have lost 433,000 manufacturing jobs. 79,000 real estate jobs have been lost. 160,000 jobs in communications industries, like wireless carriers, have been lost. Uh, we've lost 932,000 construction jobs. And these may sound like a lot of just numbers upon numbers, but behind each one of these, behind each one of these statistics is a person, a home builder, a phone salesman in the mall, a real estate agency agent uh, in your community, real people who have lost the private sector jobs that their families rely on to put food on the table, a roof over their head, and to help their kids get through school. Many Americans have gotten so discouraged by the Obama economy that they have actually given up looking for work entirely. Those Americans have uh, not given up, our, they're, they're finding it more difficult to, to get jobs, even if they're trying to find a job, and that their job search is taking much longer than they would ever have imagined. You know, over five million Americans have been searching for work for, for more than 27 weeks. That's over five million Americans who have spent more than half a year looking for work. The unemployed now spend an average of nearly 40 weeks looking for work, double the average when President Obama took office. Well, that's the equivalent of losing your job on New Year's Day and not finding work again until October. So why are the jobs so scarce? Well, it's because President Obama's policies have done far too little to help our struggling economy. And in many cases, his policies have actually hurt the economy and made things worse. Contrary to what President Obama believes, the private sector is not doing fine. And the problems, well, the problem is not just that, that we don't have enough bureaucrats. Growth in America's GDP for the first quarter of 2012 was just 1.9 percent. That's nowhere near the level we need for a healthy economy. During past recoveries from economic downturns, other presidents have presided over much faster growth. And after the recession of the early 1980s, President Reagan's economy grew much faster. Well, there is a simple reason why. And it has to do with the policies coming out of this president's administration. President Obama keeps repeating that we face economic headwinds. Well, the biggest headwinds that we are facing come from the president's own economic policies. Now, the American people understand this. They read the papers. Headlines like the one from the Washington Post on Tuesday, just two days ago. It says, quote, families see their wealth um, sapped. Uh, the American people read about the uh, bad economic data uh, saying that durable goods over uh, the orders were down 3.7 percent in March. Uh, people know that when the manufacturing sector, which is an important source of jobs, uh, when this slows down, that a dramatic slowdown does not bode well for job growth in other sectors of the economy. When, when people hear this drumbeat of, of bad economic news, it explains why the Consumer Confidence Index uh, fell again in May. That when you ask people if the country is, uh, is on the right course or not, more, the majority say it is not on the right path. When you ask if they uh, think that the president is doing a good job on the economy, they say no, that he, he is not. Confidence is down not just because the American people follow the news and know what's going on in the country, it's because they also know what is going on in their own lives, what they're seeing at home, what they're seeing with their families. And, and for many people, they are not earning as much as they had earned in the past. The median household income has fallen by over $4,000 since President Obama took office. Meanwhile, the actual costs, the costs of everyday living, continue to rise. More and more people every day are finding that for them and for their families, they just can't keep up. Today, there are more than 46 million Americans on food stamps. That's 14 million more than relied on the program in January of 2009 when President Obama was sworn into office. Sadly, 
the Congressional Budget Office uh, expects the number to go even higher over the next two years. Well, that's obviously the wrong direction. And it's a result of bad decisions and bad policies out of the President's administration. Those policies have contributed to the lower wages that we're seeing, uh, to the higher unemployment that we're living with, and to more people living in poverty. Those policies are contributing as well to the sagging home markets that threaten to keep millions of American families in dire financial straits for years to come. We all know that President Obama faced a difficult economic situation when he took office in 2009. His failed policies have not healed our economy. Higher taxes, more bureaucracy, more borrowing, more wasteful spending by Washington will continue to make things worse. Now, when you take a look at what's happening around the world with Europe facing collapse and a global slowdown that threatens our economy, the President seems more concerned with his next election than with actually taking action to make things better. Alongside all the bad economic news, ABC News reported the other day that President Obama, they said, will continue his record-smashing fundraising schedule. Record-smashing fundraising schedule. You know, that's not the kind of leadership that our economy needs today. Republicans are focused on real solutions, making our tax code simpler, flatter, and fairer for every American, reducing the debt and the deficit, ending over-regulation, the, the red tape that is burdensome, expensive, and time-consuming, putting patients and doctors, uh, their own doctors, in control of health care, not creating more Washington bureaucracy, and of course reducing our dependency on foreign oil and sending so much American money overseas. Two years ago, when the Obama administration was putting out press releases and staging photo ops to proclaim the recovery summer, Republicans were proposing real solutions to help create a healthy economy. When voters had a chance to compare the two approaches that November, November of 2010, Republicans earned control of the House of Representatives, and at that time they started passing a jobs agenda. Democrats in the Senate still don't get it, and they refused to even consider these bills passed by the House. There are 27 jobs bills that have passed the House of Representatives on bipartisan votes. The bills are still today waiting for Senate action. The President of the United States remains silent on these bills that would actually get people back to work. He is offering nothing but scare tactics, excuses, and blame. He just gave another speech today, just this very afternoon, in Ohio, and what he did was just more of that, more scare tactics, excuses, and blame, because in his mind, it seems like it's always someone else's fault. Just a matter, Madam President, where, where our economy would be today if Democrats had been willing to accept common sense Republican solutions two years ago. We would actually be in recovery today. We would have seen significant improvements to the economy. If Democrats had been willing to work with us instead of giving speeches and pushing more wasteful stimulus spending, millions of more people would be working today across the country. If President Obama had been focused on putting people back to work instead of just on keeping his own job, then today, today, the summer of 2012, the private sector and the American people really would be doing fine. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Senator from Alabama. I thank my colleague for his remarks. Uh, I caught part of the President's statement this afternoon and gotten a transcript of some of the things that he said as ranking member on the budget committee as someone who's wrestled with these numbers for uh, two years very intensely. I was shocked uh, uh, 
Senator Barrasso by some of the things he said. I just would ask you, based on the reality of the world we're in, how you react to the summary that the presidential advisor gave to the New York Times before the president's speeches today, saying that his plan focuses on education, energy, innovation, and infrastructure. First, does that suggest to you spending? Well, you know, it, uh, Madam President, if I may enter into a United ask you now, to enter into a colloquy with my with my colleague. You, know, you just talk about those things. But isn't this the same president that lobbied this body, the Senate, to block the Keystone XL pipeline that would have brought energy uh, from our northern neighbor Canada to the United States uh, and jobs uh, on the ground here in terms of construction of that pipeline? So you talk about energy and you talk about construction, uh, and that was not government spending. I mean, and, and he, yet. The president lobbied the Senate to block that. But there would have been private growth and private investment, not increasing our deficit because any new money we spend increases the debt because we're already in debt deficit. But let me ask, it goes on, in, in their summary of what he was going to say, he said the president favored a, quote, tax code that creates American jobs and pays down our debt. And first of all, is the senator uh, aware that under the president's plan that he submitted to us, the budget, that the lowest single year's deficit in the 10-year plan is $607 billion, that we never come close to paying down any debt in the plan that he submitted us? And how can the president, this is an unfair question, but I'll ask the senator uh, from Wyoming, how can the president... Uh, say that this that he's got a plan that pays down our debt when uh, the lowest single deficit he proposes is 600 plus billion dollars. Well, I, I would say to my colleague who is on the budget committee who watches these things very carefully, as I looked at what the president proposed, it never got to balance. It never even addressed the, dealing with the large deficit, let alone the monumental debt. And just in the time that we have been talking here, the last four or five minutes, we have continued to borrow money from overseas, specifically from China. And we're borrowing at a, at a, at a rate of two, we are the United States, borrowing at a rate of $2 million a minute. And, and nothing that I have seen coming from the President or from the Democrats, as a matter of fact, in the Senate, have dealt with any of those things to the point that we have not passed a budget for the last three years in this Senate, which is irresponsible. It, Absolutely is, and let me say this, in his speech, this is the quote, the transcript that I have of it, uh, he declared, both parties have laid out, laid out their policies on the table for all to see. Now, isn't it a fact that the House Republicans passed a long-term budget that would change the debt course of America, that three members of the Republican Senate laid out budgets that would have balanced the budget in the United States of America, and that the Democratic leadership never laid out a plan, refused to lay out a plan, violated the statutory law of America by refusing to lay out a plan. And they haven't laid out a plan. Isn't that true, or am I missing something? Well, that's exactly the way that, that, that I see it, because, uh, and I voted for uh, the, the plan that uh, was submitted by the House, which actually does get to a balance of our budget, uh, the, and the three uh, Senate uh, colleagues uh, on our side of the aisle who had plans that also got to balance the budget. I voted in favor of all of those, but you know, not one Democrat in the Senate, not one Democrat cast one vote in favor of any one budget, whether it were the Republican budgets, whether it were the, the president's budget, and yet the president goes to uh, Ohio today and gives a speech for 54 minutes, and it was supposed to be a big speech on the economy, and I heard nothing new, nothing that we had heard, hadn't heard before, no new ideas other than just spend more money at a time when we have we're $15 trillion in, in debt and adding to that by the minute. Uh, the president did make one interesting statement that he said, you know, some of the regulations that are coming out, he said they're not, all the regulations aren't good. Well, who can do anything about it but the president? His regulations, and he has over a, over a thousand 
new regulations that have come out under his administration that are called economically significant regulations, regu regulations that have an impact to the economy over a hundred million dollars. And those regulations, all of that red tape, is putting people out of work. It provides so much uncertainty to the economy as to what's the next regulation that's, that's coming out that, that businesses don't have the, the certainty to go hire people. What's going to happen with the health care law? Uh, is it going to be found constitutional, unconstitutional? I believe it's unconstitutional. But what are the costs going to be of, uh, to, uh, to business? So I, and it just statement after statement that the president makes uh, shows that there is a fundamental question about how his understanding of how the economy works versus people who have been out in the private sector, who created jobs, who put people to work, who, who've written uh, the, the paycheck, who signed the, uh, the front of the paycheck, who've hired folks and help an economy in a community in a, in a way that, uh, that makes a difference and builds that community. And yet I don't see those things coming out of the President's speech, certainly not today in Ohio. I just thank my colleague for those insights because this is a, a bit disappointing. It's more than disappointing. Uh, the President said again that uh, he has a plan for, on, and his plan would uh, he has a, a vision of how to create a strong, sustained growth and how to pay down our long-term debt. He does not have such a plan. His plan comes nowhere close to balancing the budget in 10 years, not a single year. The lowest single deficit he would have in 10 years is $607 billion, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Not me, the Independent Congressional Budget Office. And it's not accurate. And how can we have a bipartisan discussion on how to solve the sustained debt threat that we have in this nation if the President goes around saying his plan will help pay down our debt? It does not pay down the debt, doesn't come close to paying down the debt. And he said that last year. And I grilled his budget director at the committee. And he could not defend that statement because it's indefensible. Nobody can defend that statement. And if any member of this Congress, this Senate, a Democrat member, I urge you to come down and tell me if the plan laid out by the President of the United States, the only plan we've seen, is budget plan, uh, pays down the debt. It, it, it does not. He, uh, he, um, he, he goes on to say in this speech, uh, I signed in the law, he says, and, and, and forgive me if, if this is distressing to me, but we've been involved in this discussion a good long time. We have the United States Congress, the United States Senate, and we have the President of the United States. All have a role in formulating an economic policy for America that will put our country on a growth path to eliminate the unsustainable debt course that we are on. The phrase used so often by President Obama's own debt commission, Simpson Bowles, they told us we, uh, this nation has never faced a more predictable financial crisis. Why? Because of the increasing debt, they said. They, the path, the numbers are, are just relentless. And it's unsustainable. That's what it means. You, it, at some point, there'll be a, a credit reaction, a, de a financial collapse or a reaction that will put us back into recession and, and distress. And we need to get off that path is what they pleaded with us to do. So the president says, um, I signed in the law, I, I signed a law that cuts spending and reduces our deficit by $2 trillion. Now, what does he remain, mean by that? Well, I think most Americans can remember last August, and we, had the, we reached the debt ceiling, and we borrowed so much money, we hit the a limit of money the United States government can borrow. Congress, the President, asked us to raise that debt limit so we could keep spending and keep borrowing, and, and basically the Republican House and members in the Senate, to the extent to which we had influence, uh, said, Mr. President, we'll raise the debt limit, but we want you to reduce spending some. 
And so they agreed uh, after much debate in the wee hours of the morning at the latest possible time to cut $2.1 trillion from spending. The president went kicking and screaming to that point. The Democrats pretended it was a disaster and America was going to sink into the ocean. That's what that was all about. And here we come uh, with this uh, uh, plan, and the president now claims that it's his deal, that he cut $2 trillion. I remember how it went down, and that's not a fair thing to say. Uh, he signed that because if he didn't sign it, spending would have to be cut 40% immediately because that's how much out of every dollar we spend, uh, we borrow. We're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend. So if we hadn't raised the debt ceiling, the United States government would have to immediately cut all expenditures by 40 percent. That's why it's an unsustainable course we're on. It's not a little bitty matter. And the president suggests if you listen to his speech, don't worry about it. I've got a plan. We're moving along fine. You don't have to really sacrifice. We're going to have more education, energy, innovation, infrastructure, more spending. That's what that means. Investments, they say, that means spending, you know. But we don't have the money. This country is out of money. And it's a serious time. And we've got to make some tough decisions. And we need a chief executive telling the American people the truth about where we are rather than promising some balanced budget paying down debt that's nowhere in his plan when it's looked at. He says, uh, uh, my own deficit plan would strengthen Medicare and Medicaid for the long haul by slowing the growth of health care costs. He has steadfastly refused to reform Medicare and Medicaid. Under this $2.1 trillion, the president insisted that Medicaid not receive a dime of cuts. And it didn't receive a dime of cuts. The Defense Department gets a hammering under the cuts and the sequester. So big time, Medicaid, not a dime cut out of it. No reforms in Medicaid that would really uh, provide any benefit. Uh, anything other than drive up the cost and increase the cost of Medicaid. So how can he say that? And he's attacked Congressman Ron and the chairman of the uh, Budget Committee in the House for actually laying out a vision to try to put Medicare on a sound basis where it can actually be sustainable over time. And, and Congressman Ron has the support of, of Senator Wyden, a Democratic member of the United States Senate, he had the support of Alice Rivlin, who was President uh, uh, Clinton's, uh, one of his top officials in OMB. Um, Alice Rivlin uh, basically agreed with the uh, policies that Congressman Ryan laid out to save Medicare. And what has happened? The president calls Congressman Ryan in and attacks him on the spot. He, they're still accusing him of having a radical scheme to destroy Medicare, and nothing is, could be further from the truth. It's a plan to strengthen Medicare, to save Medicare, and put it on a sound basis so that people working today can be confident that when they retire and become eligible for it, it will be there. But you can't create something for nothing. You've got to have a plan that provides the funding for it. This is not smoke and mirrors. Nothing comes from nothing. Uh, I got to tell you, and one more thing, the president says, quote, I've signed a law that cuts spending and reduces our deficit by two trillion dollars. It cuts, that reduces our deficit by two trillion dollars. Well, he was forced into signing that bill. Did he really want to sign it? No, he didn't. Uh, we all know that. You could tell that from reading the newspapers and how the negotiations went. Our big spenders resisted that dramatically. And how much is $2 trillion over 10 years? 
we plan to spend $37 trillion over 10 years, increasing the debt by about 10 to $13 trillion. That much more debt, debt added. Uh, this would have cut it from $37 trillion being spent to $35 trillion being spent. It would have meant we would increase the deficit about $11 trillion over the next 10 years instead of uh, 13, I guess. Not nearly enough, but at least some step toward reining in uh, soaring spending. But so the president brags on that just a few minutes ago. He's bragging about it. But what, what is the real truth? The budget he submitted eviscerates that agreement. The budget he submitted in February of this year, five months after the agreement last spring, last uh, August, would wipe out the entire sequester, would eliminate a trillion dollars in cuts and add more spending. In fact, he would add under that plan $1.5 trillion more in spending than the Budget Control Act agreement he's taking credit for signing would have allowed to be spent. This is not a matter of, of dispute. This is a fact. The budget he submitted wiped out uh, a half, more than half of the cuts that were in that agreement. And he had big tax increases, uh, about $1.8 trillion in tax increases. So $1.6 trillion more in spending than we agreed to just last summer. And $1.8 trillion in more taxes. Tax, spend, tax, spend. That's what this president's philosophy is. And if he wants to stand for that, campaign on that, run on that, well and good. Be honest with the American people. But don't come in and take credit for things you resisted. Don't come in and claim credit for budget cuts that you've proposed in your budget to eliminate. And how can we have a bipartisan discussion to try to reach an agreement on what to do about the unsustainable course we're on if the president's going out and saying things that are not connected to reality? I think it's irresponsible. I really do. I don't see how a president of the United States could possibly not spend a great deal of time with the American people explaining to them why we're all going to have to tighten our belts, how we don't have the money we wish we had, that we, we're going to have to do this. Is it some sort of political fear uh, that uh, big spenders uh, will ultimately get caught if they tell the truth about how much debt their big spending has caused the country, so they just have to pretend it's not so? Well, they said President Bush had big debts. He did spend too much money, and I criticized him some on that, and, and none of us are, are perfect in this Congress, and we all uh, voted for things probably we, wouldn't, we shouldn't have. The largest debt that President Bush ever had, annual deficit, was $470 billion. That's big. It's a lot of money. President Obama's deficits have been 1,200, 1,300 all four years he's been in office. More than twice what President Bush's deficits were. He's been in office now four years. The plan he's laid out, even assuming our e economy continues to grow, as we assume in these budget analysis, uh, that uh, he does not come close to balancing the budget. Every year we're adding hundreds of billions of dollars more in debt. The lowest single year in his 10-year plan would add $600 billion more to the debt. And according to the Congressional Budget Office, uh, the interest on the debt soars. The largest single increase in spending is interest. Interest last year was $225 billion on the debt. In the 10th year of the President's budget, Congressional Budget Office projects that the interest in that one year, 10 years from now, will be $850 billion, exceeding uh, virtually every item in the uh, government, uh, including the Defense Department. So well, this is not a healthy thing. So um, in March, at a fundraiser, 
He's going to a lot of those. Sometime, somewhere, somebody's got to stay home in Washington and bring this wasteful spending to control. He was at a fundraiser in Denver and said, uh, I'm running to pay down our debt. I'm running to pay down our debt. Don't worry. Elect me. I'm going to pay down our debt. Well, that's just not what the numbers show. No plan has been laid out other than the plan he laid out in his budget. The tax, spend, and keep the debt on the same level we were on if he had no changes at all into the uh, budget situation. So, Mr. President, I, I am unhappy about it. It's uh, very distressing to me that this nation uh, is facing a crisis financially. We are all going to have to recognize we don't have the money that we would like to have to spend as we would like to spend. I told some people this morning that I had a breakfast, luncheon, a group of Air Force Association and all that we defense people needed to know we don't have the money. We don't have the money. I, for years, we're going to have to be tightening our belts, but we can work our way through it. We can do the right things. Who knows, by producing efficiencies and other uh, actions of productivity, that we could get our course country on a healthier course than we can imagine at this point. I actually think we could. But we've got to be honest about the situation. We've got to have somebody who stays in the office for a while and actually drives the restraint in spending and insist that every cabinet member, sub-cabinet member, GSA person going to a resort in Las Vegas that's spending the taxpayers' money, that they do it uh, uh, with restraint and that wasteful actions are eliminated. And that's the kind of leadership we need, and the American people need to be told uh, and we all need to understand we just don't have the money. We wish we did. And so we'll have to alter our spending levels for a few years, get this country on a sound path, uh, create confidence that will come when the world knows that we've gotten off the unsustainable debt path and gotten on a path that's uh, sustainable, uh, set on a sound path, a path that leads to prosperity, not a path that leads to debt crisis and decline but growth, prosperity, and freedom. That's what it's all about. And uh, forgive me if it's irritating to me, uh, but I uh, did conclude after today's speech that the president's made a decision that he's going to run to November. He's going to run on the fact that he is reducing the debt. That's what he's apparently said. I'm running to pay down the debt, is what he said in Denver, and he repeated that again today. And so that's got to be confronted. And if I'm wrong, I ask any member of this Senate to come forward and show me what in the President's plan leads to any conclusion that he has laid out a plan that would pay down the debt of the United States. I don't see it. I don't think it's close. I thank the Chair and would yield the floor and note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.